Let's get down to business, Mr. Fitzgerald. All right, so David Fitzgerald is an act atheist activist, writer, and national public speaker. He was the co-founder and director of the world's first atheist film festival and San Francisco's oldest annual Darwin Day celebration, Evolution, Evolution Palooza. He currently works for the Secular Student Alliance and co-runs the Godless Pervert Story Hour up in San Francisco. David is the author of, <laughs> all right, we have some, some fans. David is the author of Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All, the Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion series, and he's currently working on Jesus Mything in Action, and he has uh, several of those books here up for sale if you'd like to buy one after the event. Um, he's here tonight to entertain us with sexy violence, violent sex, the weird-ass morality of the Bible. So please join me in welcoming David Fitzgerald. <laughs> Well, like the man said, I could try to fool you and say we're having a sober and dignified uh, lecture on biblical morality, but who are we trying to kid? You know it. Sexy violence, violent sex, the weird-ass morality of the Bible. <laughs> All right, atheists, let me ask you this simple question. Where do you guys get your morals? Because Christians know you can only get your morals from objective morality. And the only objective morality is that that's grounded in the eternal Bible-based principles revealed directly by God Almighty himself. Or at least someone who tells you that's where they come from. Otherwise, let's face it, otherwise your morals are just subjective. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I mean, of course, subjective. And that's no better than being a satanic Nazi baby torture sex rapist sex cannibal. But, as any born-again Christian will tell you, the Bible has all the answers to all our ethical dilemmas. As long as you listen correctly to the correct pastor, correctly following the correct kind of Christianity with the correct interpretation of the correct doctrine taken from the correct translation of the correct Bible. <laughs> Another thing, funny thing, that even if, like this guy, you do believe there's such a thing as objective morality... Well, where do you find it in the Bible? Because, you know, I've read the Bible once or twice, and there's a lot of things in the Bible, but a good guide to a good and evil? Not so much. Allow me to present tonight a few examples of what we do find in the Bible. Now, I should tell you right off the bat, I should tell you right off the bat, I know you're atheist. You've read the book. You, I'm not going to waste your time with the stuff you already know. So, for instance... You know if this is an abomination, well, then so is this. <laughs> yep. and, you know, and you already know why this guy is not just a douche, but he's a freaking idiot. And I'm very certain that I'm very certain you're all really well acquainted with all the well-known biblical absurd atrocities that how, for instance, how it's right and moral to stone people to death for picking up firewood on the Sabbath, and how biblical slavery was actually really gentle and kind. And besides, there's just so much craziness in the Bible. It falls out like clowns from a circus car. So tonight, I've tried to limit myself not just to unbelievably messed up Bible stories. No, that's not good enough. Tonight, we're only going to touch on the ones that are doubly effed up. <laughs> yeah. A choice selection of the more twisted bits of the Bible. I'm going to see if I can't point out some of the less obvious problems in each of these stories and then explain how it's even more twisted than that. And to do that, I'll be using what I call the Weird Textural Features Index. Or for short, we can call it the WTF. <laughs> So let's begin. Let's go straight to God's plan for marriage. Okay, we know there all are exactly one bazillion Christian books on sale right now, all offering to tell you God's eternal plan for marriage, which, spoiler alert, turns out to be one man, one woman, no exceptions. Fair enough. But there's just one hitch. Who in the Bible actually follows this plan? Because Abraham sure doesn't. Jacob doesn't, Moses doesn't, Joshua doesn't, Gideon doesn't. Oh no, Gideon didn't have 300 wives, he only had 30 wives. Uh, Samson sure as hell didn't. 
Uh, King David didn't. Solomon didn't. Not even Jesus. Not even the apostles. And for sure, this man didn't. <laughs> well, yeah. He would rather have hung out with his beloved fellow missionary Barnabas, or his beloved sidekick <laughs> Timothy, or his beloved slave boy Onesimus, who Paul says ministers to me in my chains. He also repeatedly instructs the brethren to greet one another with a holy kiss and says things like, it's good for a woman, a man not to touch a woman. And he wishes that all men were like him, perfectly able to resist the temptations of women. But please, don't get me started on Paul because that's an entirely different talk altogether. All right, but what about those biblical characters who actually do like girls? Options for sex in the Bible are surprisingly bountiful. You can have sex with all the wives that you can manage, plus your wives' employees, your handmaidens, uh, your slaves. And here's a bonus. If you're a slave, your master can assign a wife to you. Lucky you, slave. Uh, your concubines, of course. That's a given. Uh, any female prisoners of war you capture. Yep. Uh, your lesser known one. Your sister-in-law. If your brother dies, you are actually required to impregnate her. And finally, of course, any woman you happen to rape. But hey, 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 it's no free ride. Just because you rape her, that means you have to, by law, marry her or stone her to death. And finally, several of God's favorites even have sex with common harlots, and God is totally cool with it. However, marrying outside your race or religion, now that really displeases the Lord. So the next time someone tells you that we need to defend traditional biblical marriage or tells you that the Bible is the only source of objective morality, you should agree and then ask to explain why you can't have a second wife or a handmaiden or a concubine. <laughs> and really, just about the only ones who do seem to follow God's eternal plan for marriage are these two. And again, what choice did they have? <laughs> But let me talk about two that also work, and that's Ruth and Boaz. Well, first, I'll give you the Sunday school version. The story of Ruth and Boaz is a heartwarming story of a young Moabite widow who loves her Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi, so much that when Ruth's husband dies, she chooses to go back with Naomi to Bethlehem, saying, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Oh, Christians love that story. It's such an awesome story, but I can't help but think that if this had been an Israelite girl telling her Moabite mother-in-law, your gods will be my gods, well, then she'd be a filthy pagan idolater and heretic. <laughs> but anyway, the two women go to Bethlehem, and Ruth works in a barley field to earn a living for him. She meets the field o field's owner, who turns out to be a handsome relative of Naomi's named Boaz. She tells Naomi how much she likes rich, handsome Boaz, and Naomi tells her what she should do, which is this. Go that night and find Boaz sleeping on the threshing floor. Uncover his feet and lie down, and he'll tell you what to do next. <laughs> what? It's a sweet story. Well, that's exactly what Ruth does. So Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and finds Ruth lying at his feet. He says, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your handmaiden. So spread your skirt over your handmaiden. Boaz says, sure, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, lie down and spend the night. So she does. In the morning, she gets up before anyone else shows up, and he tells her, now, don't let anyone know a woman spent the night here, and sends her home with six measures of barley, the ancient Hebrew equivalent of cab fare. <laughs> Long story short, that very day, Boaz goes and buys Ruth to be his wife, and they all live happily ever after. Now, I grant you that the story gets a little dodgy there at the end with the wife buying and all, but all in all, you've got to admit, it's pretty wholesome on fairly tame on the WTF scale, no more than a two or three. But of course, that was the Sunday school version. <laughs> Let's take a closer look. Now, for starters, some GLBT oh, <laughs> advocates have uh, pointed out that when Ruth declares her love to her mother-in-law, Naomi, it uses the exact Hebrew word used to describe how Adam loved Eve and how spouses are supposed to love each other. Okay, I'm just saying that maybe that's debatable, but this part isn't. See, I forgot to tell you something about Naomi's advice to Ruth. Uh, did I mention that Naomi told her to wait until Boaz was drunk before she should go out and look for him? And this 
uncover his feet business. Well, most biblical translations fail to mention that feet or legs is a common euphemism in biblical Hebrew for three guesses? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And what's more, spreading your skirt over someone is another euphemism for doing it. <laughs> so to update our story from heartwarming to hot tamale, Ruth took Naomi's advice to uncover Boaz's junk and then told him to spread his skirt over her. So can I get a boom chicka wow wow? <laughs> so our timeless story of true love between a man, a woman, and her mother-in-law is actually a steamy little letter to Palestinian Penthouse magazine featuring a midnight hookup to drunkenly fornicate with a non-Israelite and the outside possibility of some milfy lesbian crush. Not too bad. Talk about going Old Testament on your ass. And actually, while we're on the subject of going Old Testament on your ass, let's look at the subject of David and Jonathan, courtesy of the Brick Bible. <laughs> My favorite version of the Bible told in Legos because not only is it 100% accurate, it's also made by an atheist author. Now, theologians are quick to tell us that there is nothing homosexual at all about David and Jonathan's manly love, even when David, who's described in the Bible as having red hair and beautiful eyes, says things like, My brother Jonathan, greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Clergy insist that not only is that not at all gay, but if you think it is, you're probably gay. <laughs> I'll let you guys be the judge, though. Well, we know how the story starts. David famously kills the Philistine giant Goliath. And after he's done that, he becomes the King Saul's court, a hero beloved by all, and none more so than the king's own son, Jonathan. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's home. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David and because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David, uh, the robe, I mean, <laughs> and his armor, and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Well, David becomes so popular that the king becomes afraid of him. Um, oh, there he is chopping off 187 Philistine foreskins. <laughs> and... And the king develops this nasty bad habit of throwing spears at David nearly every chance he gets. Well, when Saul told his son Jonathan that he was actively planning to kill David, the prince was upset because, as the Bible says, he took great delight in David. So he went and warned David that his father was out to kill him and told him to hide until he sent word that King Saul had backed off from his plot to murder David and it was safe to return. Well, after the cycle repeated a few times, David secretly met with Jonathan and said, Your father knows well that you like me, and the next time he's not going to tell you when he's going to kill me. Jonathan says, Whatever you tell me to do, that's what I will do. So David came up with a plan, and Jonathan replied to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. And there, Jonathan made a covenant with David and made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own life. Later, back at the king's palace, Saul was suspicious to find that David was not at the royal feast. Jonathan tried to tell him that David had gone to Bethlehem for a family religious service, but Saul wasn't buying it. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. He said to him, You son of a rebellious whore, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness? Now bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Jonathan asked him, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? So Saul threw a spear at him. <laughs> Jonathan left the table and refused to eat for a whole day, for he was grieved for David. In the morning, Jonathan slipped out to find David in the field where he was hiding and gave him the bad news. They kissed each other and wept with each other. And afterwards, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. David got up. Oh, I guess they were lying down. Hmm. <laughs> And he left, and Jonathan returned to the city. They would never see each other alive again. So maybe all the innuendo is just circumstantial evidence, and it, you know, it might just be me, but that does strike me as a little on the gay side. Um, especially for the Old Testament. And so these homoerotic yearnings give us a modest WTF scale of five. But I have to tell you, 
I do have my doubts about this whole story, and here's where the story gets truly perverse. You see, the entire story of David's rise to power is political propaganda that was written years after the fact by a court historian of King David's. Now, while David's portrayed as an innocent and loyal servant of King Saul, the bitter truth is David didn't just accidentally become king. And Saul and Jonathan and all the rest of the heirs to the throne didn't just happen to all get killed. And maybe David did love Jonathan, and maybe it's just coincidence that Jonathan and all the other heirs died, or that the only eyewitnesses to Saul's death were also executed by soldiers of David. But anyway, gay subtexts are no, that's how David became king. So perhaps we should be a little cautious about taking any of this story <laughs> at face value. Okay, here's a legitimate Bible miracle. The miracle is that the Song of Solomon made it into the Bible at all. It's one of the only books in the Bible where God isn't even mentioned once. And although it reads just like a very erotic love poem, religious leaders are very quick to assure us that it's really, really a beautiful allegory for the love of God for his chosen people, or the love of Jesus for his church, or something. So to help me with this wonderful story, please uh, allow the fabulous Amy B. to come up and help me out with this. Please give a big hand for Amy B. And Maestro, could you give us some uplifting spiritual music to help this out? Yes, that will work very, very nicely. Take it away, Miss Amy. You're doing great. Here we go. All right. Let him kiss me mm. with the kisses of his mouth. Yeah. For thy love is better than wine. Yeah, baby. A bundle of myrrh is right. my beloved to me. Mm -hmm. He shall lie all night. Yeah. Twist my breast. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You're doing great, baby. Like the finest apple tree in the orchard is my lover among other young mm -hmm. men. I delight to sit in his shade yeah, baby. and taste his delicious. Mm. Fruit. Taste it, baby. Taste it. My beloved is gone down. Oh, yeah. Into his garden. Mm, 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 to mm. the beds of spices. To feed in mm. the gardens. Mm. And to gather the lilies. Oh, yeah, he is. Oh, yeah, he is. I am my beloved. Mm. And my beloved is mine. He feedeth among mm. the lilies. Yeah. Mm. Ow! Ow! Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of Bether. Say it, baby. Yeah, say it. Mm. <laughs> By night, on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I found him yeah, whom my soul yeah, loveth. Did, baby. I yeah. held him and would not mm -hmm. let go mm -hmm. until go. I had brought him into my mother's house Come to mama. and into the chamber yeah. of her that oh. conceived me. Mm -hmm. Awake! Awake, north wind, and come, south wind, blow on my garden, mm. that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Mm. Let my beloved come into oh, his garden yeah. and taste its choice fruits. <laughs> he says, I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. He says, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. My beloved put his hand by the latch of my door. Oh. oh, say it, say it, baby. And my heart yearned for him. Mm -hmm. I arose 
to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet smelling mm. perfume. Mm. 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 I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine, of the juice of my pomegranate. <laughs> yeah. His left hand should be under my head. No, that's the left hand. Yeah, yeah. Left hand. Their left. And his right hand should embrace me. <laughs> How fair and delectable you are. <laughs> Let's lift up the thing. Oh. oh, loved one, delectable maiden, you are as stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb that palm tree and lay hold of its branches. Oh! Big hand for the fabulous Miss Amy B. Thank you, Maestro. Thank you, Maestro. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Who knew the love of God for his chosen people was so down and dirty? That Yahweh is one sexy motherfucker. <laughs> Woo. Now, I have to tell you, those are kind of the best bits, because really, there's other verses that don't work quite so well, such as, oh, let's see, uh, your teeth are as a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren amongst them. Or, thy two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Thy hair is like a flock of goats coming down from Gilead. Thine eyes are like the fish poles of Heshbon, near the gate of Bathrabim. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh towards Damascus. Well, even when the song compares feminine beauty to things like sheep and goats, you might think it's still just maybe a little too sexy for the stodgy old Bible. And you know what? You would be absolutely right, because it appears that the whole Song of Solomon is actually a leftover from the worship of two older, sexier gods. The woman in the song is called the Shulamite, which some scholars have identified as the moon goddess Ishtar Shalmuth, and her lover slash brother is the pagan god Tammuz. Now, Tammuz was big in ancient Israel. Ezekiel complains about Israelite women worshiping Tammuz right in the temple itself, and a month on the Hebrew calendar is still named after Tammuz. But why are we talking about all this sex stuff? We're supposed to be talking about morals, right? You know, it's funny, it's so weird. After God went to all the trouble of unleashing plagues on Egypt ten times, rescuing the Israelites from slavery, even parting the Red Sea, and traveling them with, as a pillar of fire, and pretty much continually smiting all their enemies and any of their own people who complained too much, the Israelites still kept forgetting that God was there. Ah, silly Hebrews. Case in point, the tale of the orgy at Shittim. Yes, that's right. The orgy at Shittim. So when the Israelites were camped at Shittim, sinful Moabite women invited the Israelite men to the local Moabite religious service, namely a big-ass orgy of food and sex. Well, naturally, God was pissed and told Moses to take all the Israelite chieftains and impale them in the sun before the Lord in order that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Well, in a case of really unfortunate timing... Just then, an Israelite shows up with his hot Midianite girlfriend, and while the rest of the Israelites are crying over this latest bombshell from Moses, in full view of Moses and everybody, they run off to their tent. So the son of one of the priests loses it, grabs a spear, and goes in after them, killing them both with a single thrust through the belly. And God is so touched by this pious act that he only kills 24,000 Israelites with a plague. But don't get him wrong, he's still miffed about those sexy Moabites and Midianites, and just a few chapters later, he sends his chosen people to go to war against them. Well, this being the Old Testament, they win, naturally. And they kill all the Midianite kings, and they kill all the Midianite men, and they burn their cities, and they take everything, goods, flocks, cattle, and all the women and children. Well, when Moses sees that all the women and children are still alive, he's furious, and demands to know why the commanders allowed all the women to live. He commands them, Now kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman who slept with a man. But all the young girls who are virgins, keep alive for yourselves. Charming, right? 
Maybe we should stop and just check our WTF count so far. Let's see. We have got pagan orgy, mass execution, sexy double murder with God's blessing, plague, genocidal war, second round of genocide for women and children, and the survivors get to become sex slaves. So I hope you're picking up on all the good moral values here. It is already tipping the scales at a 9.5 on the WTF. That is a seriously weird textural feature. How can it get any higher? Here's how. The Lord also demanded his share of the booty, which was given as a burnt offering to the Lord. 72 oxen, 675 sheep and goats, 61 donkeys, and 32 people, all given as a burnt offering unto the Lord. Which gives us an updated WTF rank of holy, horrific, or absurd, or 10. But wait, I hear what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You went to Sunday school. God loves you. Surely he would never take human sacrifices. Oh, yes. God hates human sacrifices when they're to other gods, because he is, after all, a jealous God. Well, what does God say? Now, well, sure, there's a verse or two that insists that God would never do such a thing. But for every one of those, there are other verses that show that not only is he totally cool with human sacrifice, it, there's sometimes when he straight up demands it. Now, Christians still find ways to dance around verses like these, saying, oh, they aren't really talking about human sacrifice to the Lord just because that's what it says it is. Or, it's okay because God lets you redeem your firstborn child with cash, so you don't have to sacrifice them. Thanks, God. And others say these verses are just a colorful way of describing capital punishment or ancient warfare or God's divine judgment. Our good pal here, William Lake Craig, gives a wonderful, spirited, lovely defense of biblical genocide, which boils down to basically, if they're bad, they deserve it, and if they're innocent, they'll go to heaven. Yay! I cannot imagine how that doctrine can go wrong. Hooray for Christian morality! And of course, of course, Christians always point to the story of Abraham and Isaac as proof that God wouldn't ever really accept human sacrifice. We all know God was just dicking around with Abraham when he ordered him to kill his only beloved son, Isaac, as a burnt offering. All-knowing God was simply testing Abraham to see what he was due. So what was God thinking when it was Jephthah's turn? How many people learned about Jephthah in their Sunday school class? Oh, one or two, okay. Well, for the rest of you, the Israelite uh, general Jephthah vowed that if God gave him victory in battle, he would take the first person to greet him when he returned home and offer them up as a burnt offering unto the Lord. Oh, unfortunately for him, it was his beloved daughter. And the strange thing, this time, when the fatal hour came, God didn't send in any angels to stop the proceedings. He just let Jephthah go right ahead and kill his only child. Say, so makes a one me wonder, why did the Israelites keep forgetting that God hated human sacrifice so much? It seems like that's kind of a big thing to slip your mind. Well, maybe it's because, of course, secretly he loves it. In one remarkable passage, the Lord let it slip that not only did he issue bad laws, he made his chosen people sacrifice their children to him. But why? I gave them statutes that were not good and ordinances by which they could not live. I defiled them through their very gifts in offering up all their firstborn in order that I might horrify them so that they might know that I am the Lord. So there you go. At least he had a good reason. He had a reason. All right, okay, I grant you, that was a doozy. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, beloved, brace yourselves because for sheer Mondo Bizarro Old Testament what the fuckery, you cannot beat what I'm about to tell you in just three short verses from early in Moses' career. Let me set the stage. All right, Moses, our former Egyptian prince, is now currently a humble Israelite shepherd. Well, one day, God appears to him in the form of a burning bush and tells him that he's going to deliver God's chosen people from slavery in Egypt. The Lord arms him with a bunch of cool magic tricks to show Pharaoh and tells him what to say. So Moses gathers up his family, his wife, his black wife, and his Midianite wife. Yes, Moses had a black wife and a Midianite wife. Um, and heads south. Well, then God appears to his brother Aaron and tells him to meet Moses in the wilderness so the two brothers can go down to Egypt, warn of the ten increasingly nasty plagues about to hit uh, uh, Egypt, free the Israelites, and bring them to the promised land. Mm. Oh yeah, one more thing. And in the middle of all that, this happens. And it came to pass that by the way of a roadside inn, that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone 
and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. And then she said, A bloody husband art thou to me because of the circumcision. Okay. Let's recap. Here's a little cartoon. Meanwhile, on the way to Egypt, It is I, the Lord. I've come to kill you, Moses. What? But I'm on the way to do your bidding. I must act fast and circumcise our baby to save my husband. Now you're a bridegroom of blood to me, Moses. Ooh. Well done, Zipporah. You've saved your husband's life. Now, here's the funny thing. This is making fun of this little event in the Bible, and yet it's not even as screwed up as what the Bible is actually saying happens here. So this is what it's saying, that God, out of the blue, decides to kill Moses, so he jumps him by a roadside inn and tries unsuccessfully to kill him. And somehow, Moses' wife knows just what's going to fix this situation, an impromptu foreskin circumcision with a nearby jaggedy rock. And when she throws the foreskin at Moses, then God lets him go. And the story continues as if nothing bizarre had happened at all. Mm, mm, mm. So clearly, right off the back, we're already looking at a full tin on the WTF scale. And I have to tell you, as a... a, 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 a Atheist biblical enthusiast, it gives me such great pleasure to look at Christians making sense of this, uh, watching highly trained biblical scholars squirm as they try to make sense out of just these three little verses. And once again, even highly intelligent, highly educated believers can't agree on just what the hell their own scriptures are saying. But now I really want to blow your minds because, believe it or not, yes, even this passage gets weirder. Here's what I suspect is going on in this case. We know the Hebrew scriptures are a mishmash of many different stories, especially the first two books, Genesis and Exodus. In fact, most of the stories of Moses seem to have originally been about other local tribal holy men and heroes, and their various stories came gathered together under his name. For instance, the story of Moses being found in a, floating in a basket in the river is taken from the early Akkadian legend of Sargon. Now, the jarring way this little snippet about circumcision, no pun intended, I swear, um, that it intrudes into the text is a dead giveaway that it was originally taken from um, some other story altogether. Now, Jehovah bushwhacks Moses very undivinely in this incident, and so I'd be willing to bet that in the original story, the hero was attacked by an angel or some other god altogether. And sure enough, in some medieval and, and later Jewish commentaries on this, the culprit in the story is the angel of the Lord, or even in some cases, Satan. But whoever the attacker originally was, the standard biblical scholarly interpretation of this passage is that for some reason, Jehovah wants to kill Moses, and it's for neglecting to circumcise his son. But there's several reasons why I don't think that's the case. To begin with, look what happens. Zipporah saves the day by casting a bloody foreskin at Moses' feet. But as we've already seen, feet doesn't always mean feet in biblical Hebrew. So where'd she really throw it? And it turns out, I found out after I made this slide, that the Hebrew word that they use for casting or tossing or chucking it at him is a misnomer. In the original Hebrew, she touches it to his feet. <laughs> and then there's the very odd thing she calls Moses, a bloody husband or a bridegroom of blood. There's some kind of linguistic mix-up going here. I haven't been able to sort it out exactly, but I have heard some claim that the Hebrew for bridegroom of blood comes from a Semitic root word, which means perform marriage. And in Arabic, it means perform circumcision. And in ancient Akkadian, which would have been spoken by Midianite women like Zipporah, it means to protect. And so maybe you bloody husband or bridegroom of blood really meant something along the lines of this blood will protect you. I'm still looking at that. And the only reason I bring up something so speculative is it completely jibes with what I think is going on here. What seems to be happening in this bizarre story is that by touching the foreskin to Moses' feet, and saying the magic words, she either fools his godly attacker into thinking that Moses was circumcised, or the bloodthirsty attacker is appeased by this little blood ritual. Now, incidentally, some scholars have speculated that circumcision itself started as the mark of a slave or as a substitution for human sacrifice. But in any case, no matter how you slice it, again, no, no, no pun intended, <laughs> this one goes to 11. <laughs> Boom, off the chart, WTF. Okay, but again, that's the Old Testament. That's the old thing. We've got the new thing. Now, this awesome new thing, the New Testament, that updates all that Bronze Age bullshit. 
And thank God it does, because all that unpleasant is over, and we don't have to worry about those beautiful, objective, universal, eternal, Old Testament moral truths. Here comes Jesus. He's all full of love and forgiveness, and he doesn't care if you eat shrimp or pick up sticks on the Sabbath or spill your seed. Thank goodness for me. Now it doesn't matter. Why? It's because Jesus fulfilled the law. Now, he didn't change the law or say they were wrong. He fulfilled them. So now we're no longer under the law. And you know why? It's because Jesus, who after all is God made flesh, came down to earth to pay the price of our sins to God, who is himself. Because torture slash suicide slash blood sacrifice was apparently the only way that God slash himself could bring himself to forgive the human beings that he made for being exactly the way that he made them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I got that right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That makes good sense. I mean, he would love to forgive. He'd love to forgive people the way you or I can. But of course he can't. His omnipotent hands are tied. Sure, he's infinitely merciful, but he's also holy. He's a God of justice. He's all-powerful and infinitely just, but he's just not that all-powerful and infinitely just. Here's the funny thing, though. Ask a Christian, if you're infinitely just and infinitely merciful... Christians have never put it together that you can't be both at the same time. You have to pick one. And now most of us, of course, are rightly horrified by what passes for morality in the Old Testament. Consider what a mockery of morality that Jesus brings to the table. The notion that every single human being deserves eternal punishment in a fiery hell, torture, for the crime of being human. And the only way to escape that nightmare is to unconditionally surrender to Jesus and do or don't do whatever he tells you to. Or actually what somebody else tells you he told you. What better scheme could there be to short-circuit real morality? But you know... (laughs) Maybe the real question isn't, is this moral? Maybe the real question should be, Does this make any damn sense in the first place? Now, the New Testament makes it very clear that blood drives the engine of salvation. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, it says in Hebrews and Ephesians and 1 Peter, Romans, Revelations, Ephesians, Colossians. And the Old Testament actually handedly breaks down how the process actually works. First of all, the sinner sins. God gets mad. The sinner kills and sacrifices an animal. The animal's blood and fat is burned, and the smell of the burning blood and fat goes up to God. God smells it and is pleased. God forgives the sinner. Repeat as needed. But here's the thing. How does this sacrificial system work in Jesus' case? Who likes the smell of Jesus' blood? And why is it again he can't just, you know, forgive sin in the first place? Well, let's say for argument's sake that any of this makes any sense, and we accept the premise that somehow, in order to forgive our sins, God has to die. (laughs) Well, as the bumper sticker says, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. So if God has to hold his nose to let the Christians into heaven, why can't he just do that for everybody? What's going to be different in heaven? How are these imperfect sinners not going to wreck the joint? Are they going to like lose their free will and become some kind of spiritual robots? No? Well, how else would it work then? And again, if God can pull off that little trick all along, why can't he just do it for everybody? Why all the torture porn? And where did all this pesky evil come from in the first place? How did that screw-up happen? And what about the devil? Why is Satan so damn hardworking if we all know that he loses in the end? What's in it for him? Does he know something we don't know? And you have to admit, his backstory is a little fishy. He's supposed to be a fallen angel, and that he and a third of all the angels rebelled and became demons? Um, How does God not see that coming? How in the hell can you have a civil war in heaven? And if it happened once, who's to say it couldn't happen again? And what does an omnipotent God need with helpers in the first place? No matter how you slice it, heaven and hell just make no damn sense. Well, one more thing before we wrap up. Is there a sin that's so big that God himself can't lift it? The Bible says there is. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is so bad that even though Jesus will forgive it, the Holy Spirit can't forgive it. 
Whew, that's really bad. But um, what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? And why is the Holy Spirit such a pissy little bitch about it? <laughs> Did I just blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? Ugh, fuck, fucking Holy Spirit, damn it. Mm. Well, strangely, the Bible doesn't even tell us what constitutes blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is a little weird since they're yaxing on so long about Philistine foreskins and who begat who. And here's another thing. If Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same, and Jesus can find in his heart to forgive blasphemy, well, according to the transitive property, the Holy Spirit should too, shouldn't he? Or she, or it, or whatever the hell stupid bird spirit creature the Holy Spirit's supposed to be. But really, really, let's face it. Are you really beyond all redemption and damned to eternal hell, even if you say or even just think Something along the lines of, I don't know, I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, that mythological douchebag of a mythological fucktard, douchey fucking thing. Well, all right, so I don't know why I'm going off with the F-bombs. It's, it's, it's lazy comedy. It's, uh, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, can you forgive me for that? Because if you do, congratulations. You just did something God Almighty can't do. So why do we call God things, things like infinitely merciful when clearly he's not? I can certainly find in my heart to forgive you if you do that's nasty things against me, and I strongly suspect you can too. So why can't God? Is he really that big an asshole? And if he's not, well, why does the Bible tell little kids that he is then? Or that there's such a thing as an unforgivable sin? Honestly, why does anybody take this fucking book so seriously in the first place? And come on, come on, blasphemy? Really, that's the worst sin you can get. Really? Worse than... Uh, you don't know. Yeah, satanic, Nazi, baby, torture, rape, sex, cannibalism. I'd say that's a little higher up on the blasphemometer. Is it worse than, say, oh, I don't know, molesting children repeatedly and then methodically covering up cases of sex abuse, enabling literally thousands of pedophiles around the world to continue to rape boys and girls for decades, if not centuries, if not 2,000 years? Is it worse than genocide? Is it worse than killing whole families, except, of course, for the young girls to make your sex slaves? Is it worse than slavery? Is it worse than human sacrifice? Is it worse than telling your children that an invisible man in the sky is judging them for every thought, or that doubt is a sin? It seems to me that even if there was a God in the first place, and let's face it, that is a big-ass if, it seems to me there's a hell of a lot worse than not taking a god seriously or dying before you kiss his ass enough times and in the right way or even just not being convinced by the lack of evidence and the generally dodgy arguments made on his behalf to think he ever existed in the first place. Now, on the other hand, if Christianity began as just another modest Mesopotamian hill tribe cult whose taboos and blood sacrifices slowly and painfully evolved into a regional temple system and in a monotheistic national religion and in a pagan-style mystery faith and an exclusivist philosophy, theology that continued to branch out and mutate into new schisms, heresies, cults, and religious movements for thousands and thousands of years, well, then it makes perfect sense why it's such a crazy mess today. And it makes perfect sense why the biggest sin in Christianity is laughing at it. Thanks very much. All right. So Dave's going to hang out, and uh, he's got a few books to, that he can sell and autograph if you'd like. Do we have time to do Q&A after? Do you want to do some Q&A? Sure, we can do some Q&A. Anybody have any questions? Me? I mean... Or comments? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? You're all stunned. They're yeah. all stunned. They want to buy books. What Let's just happened? This brought up, is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Something interesting for me, because I am trained in the Renaissance and Reformation. And you go back to the Christianity suits the purposes of whatever mm. era you're in, because Henry VIII had to get a dispensation from the Pope to yeah. marry Catherine, who yeah. was the widow of his, his brother who died. And then he turned around 20 years later and he go, seeks the dis dispensation of the Pope to dump her uh. on the grounds that he couldn't marry his 
dead brother's sister, and so that Would, he could marry. And Anne that's Boleyn. just biblical. That's a requirement. Uh, why? Yeah. With, it's clear in the Bible, but Absolutely. then, of course, back then it would have been in Latin, but Henry uh, knew Latin. Yes. yes. And the Pope wouldn't give, partly wouldn't give the, the, reverse the dispensation because he was busy with the sack of Rome by the <laughs> Holy Roman <laughs> Emperor. Yeah. But there it is very clear in the Bible that he didn't yeah. need a dispensation in the first place. And not only that, but you can take advantage of uh, examples of that from Christian history for 2,000 years. Um, and the thing that kills me, why do Christians not believe in evolution? Because all you have to do is look at Christianity, and you've got a perfect example of a Darwinian jungle going on, mutating constantly all the time. And it's not stopped mutating today. It's mutating right now as we speak. To fill every niche and to fill every every different market uh, uh, niche uh, that you have. Way in the back, yeah. Oh, I'm coming. I always thought it's ironic that you've got the KKK who loves Jesus, who are burning the churches of black people who love Jesus. You've got uh, homophobic Jesus who is uh, persecuting the gays and the transgender and the lesbians who worship a loving Jesus. It's just there's a Jesus for everybody, especially in America. I'm so glad you brought up uh, Jephthah and his, his hapless daughter who has no name. Yeah. Uh, because anybody who, who wants to talk about the morality of the Bible, it's easy to say, what is it, Judges 11.30? It's in Judges, uh, yeah. Chicken shit guy yeah. makes a promise to kill somebody, and she pays the price for yep. his stupid deal. And it's like... If your God hates human sacrifice, why are you making that deal in the first place? Exactly. You know? but, but see, the, the underlying premise is that accountability is fungible in the Bible. It's right. completely upside down yep. that Jesus can take it, you can buy it and sell it, that children have to pay the price for their, for their parents' faults. You know what's even more sickening to me personally? Is when you read uh, versions of the Bible now, like, um, I'm not sure if NIV pulls this little trick, but there's uh, the college uh, marketed Bible. When they tell that story, they totally whitewash it, and it's like, oh no, he didn't sacrifice her. He, she just had to keep her virginity for her life. They completely take <laughs> what it says and do the opposite and hold her up as a great example of what Christian girls should be permanently virgined. One, one more thing. Yeah. You often hear the quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. Gave? A son is not a bargaining chip or a token to give. That is bull. And it's, and it's himself. It's himself. So it's like, uh, anyway. And didn't quite give it. It just it makes little or no sense. Like you said, it was a bad weekend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that's it. Yeah. When we die, we do it real. We do it for keeps. If for you keeps. just, I mean, he probably couldn't wait to get back to heaven. It's like, you know. 72 hours in Judea and hell, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a slumming it for it. I was curious, how good is the evidence, or I know it might be a subjective, but that Paul could have been a, a gay man. A homosexual? Yes. Yeah. And again, I don't, want, I don't want to come off as some kind of uh, prude. I would love it if Paul was gay. I love gay people. I'm from San Francisco. I don't want to say, make it seem like I'm bagging on gay people at all. Um, and yet, that said, um, uh, oh, I, actually, this is a good segue, because... This talk that you've just heard tonight, um, that's going to be not the next book in the series uh, I'm working on, but the, the book after that uh, in the Complete Heritage Guide to Western Religion. It's going to be the Sex and Violence book. And I'm going to talk a great deal about Paul. Now, I can't prove mathematically that Paul was gay, and it really, it's not no water off my neck or whatever the term is, if he was or wasn't. But there's so many things that only make sense if he was super closeted gay uh, in his story. And um, if you read the, the, the book of Philemon, a very short book, um, Christians love to say, oh, it's holding up, he's, he's, he's vouching for this slave who's now free, and it's talking about how all brothers are equal in Christ. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's about Paul cajoling this slave owner to return this runaway slave to Paul because he loves Paul. He ministers to me in my chains, and I love him so much, and I will just hold him and stroke his fur. It's, like, it's, it's super, super gay. It's super gay. I'm sorry. Um, these are not scientific theological terms, but I, I do have a talk where I do make the argument that um, how ironic is it that some of the most homophobic things in Christianity came from the mouth of somebody who seems by all extents and purposes a closet case. And could Christianity have been kinder and gentler to homosexuality right from the get-go? Or would it have just never gotten off the ground if this closet case hadn't been repressing himself so hard and flagellating himself that drove him to deaths, you know? 
In any case, they didn't, so fuck them, you know, but, <laughs> but there you go. Any other questions, comments? All right, let's give them another round of applause then. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Oh. If I can just be a promo whore for just a few more minutes. Um, if you did like the talk, um, I say the same thing about R Richard Carrier, Seth Andrews, Greta Christina. If you like what we're doing, the best way you can help us is to buy our books. Second best way is to write about them, uh, a writer review, or tell your friends about them on, on uh, Facebook or on um, uh, you know, the web, the thing. The, the interweb. The interwebs, yes. Uh, I, have, uh, I have two books here tonight, uh, Nailed and The Complete Heritage Guide to Western Religion, The Mormons. Um, I also have two good uh, books here by my friend Kilt Kilpatrick. They are heretic-friendly erotica, and um, some are science fiction, some are fantasy. They're all very erotic. They're not, they're not for, for children, not safe for work, but, uh, but they are geared to a, an atheist audience. They, they're not, they don't beat you over the head, but they're, they're nice little jabs, you know, um, and I think you'll enjoy them. I especially enjoy them because I am Kilt Kilpatrick. When I'm not <laughs> writing uh, biblical history, I'm writing smut for the... For atheists, basically. Um, and we have it here tonight for you, and I would love to sell it to you. We've got kilts here, in the flesh. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, brother. Thanks so much. All right. So that's it for tonight. Uh, please throw a couple bucks in the jar on your way out. Please buy a, a book or two, and uh, we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you.